Welcome back to the G Lab. It's Mr. G's Guide to Dating. That's right. You rock. Yeah, that's original. I'm going to give you some good pickup lines here in case. Oh, that's pretty bad. Um, we're not, of course, talking. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Um, let me guess. Rock hard. All right, Mr. G's Guide to Dating. We're talking about dating rocks here, of course, and uh, there are two main kinds of dating. There's relative dating, and no, it's not what you think, and uh, it doesn't really mean that you're dating your relatives. Uh, it means that you're uh, dating rocks in a certain way, and then there's absolute dating. And, uh, oh, geez, they keep getting worse. It's terrible. So relative dating is basically finding the approximate age of a rock based on its relationship to other rock layers. Essentially looking at uh, a bunch of layers of rock and figuring out which one's older and which one's younger. And, uh, and that's all about, you can tell. You can tell uh, you know, what's younger and what's, what's older. So the key words here, of course, are relative. So relate and relationship. So it's the relationship of one rock layer to another, which one's older, which one's younger. Absolute dating is a little bit different. That's finding the exact age of a rock using radioactive isotopes. So isotopes are essentially atoms that have an unusual number of neutrons and uh, are unstable oftentimes. Radioactive isotopes are unstable. And so if you look at, say, the, the nucleus where you've got protons and neutrons, and here's, say, potassium, what eventually happens with a potassium uh, atom is that it may give off a little particle of some protons or neutrons and by doing so it changes the number of protons and neutrons in its nucleus and it actually becomes a different element. It changes from potassium to argon. And since we know the exact rate at which this occurs we can then use this to figure out by looking at how much potassium and argon are in a rock we can find out the exact age of that rock based on the rate of what we call radioactive decay. Okay, a lot of details there, but basically we're, uh, we're able to find the exact age of a rock. It's a little more expensive, it uh, requires some uh, fancier equipment, and uh, it can only be done with rocks that really have a birthday. So absolute dating can only be done on igneous rocks because they sort of form at a certain time and then they start to slowly give off those uh, radioactive particles and become more stable after that date. doesn't really work uh, with sedimentary rock because those little grains are all from all different parent rocks and are there for uh, various ages. All right, so relative dating, absolute dating. We're going to focus mostly on relative dating and uh, we'll bring in absolute dating a little bit later on. So relative dating is basically looking at the layers upon layers upon layers of sedimentary rock that make up the um, what we call the geologic column. So here, for instance, is the Grand Canyon. This here, uh, part of it is the Grand Canyon. It's about 4,000 feet deep. The Colorado River sits right down in here. And, uh, and uh, if you go a little bit farther away from the Grand Canyon, you can actually find that the rock layers in the Grand Canyon continue upward all the way up through Zion and Bryce Canyon, which is in Utah. I, th I think it's somewhere around, it could be up, up to like 9,000 feet above sea level. It's way up there. This is a, a massive amount of sedimentary layers. And by putting them all together, we can actually uh, um, trace this through time over the last um, billion plus years. And, um, and look at all the different layers that have been laid down uh, underneath shallow seas or in the ocean. Pretty amazing. So here's how this works basically. Um, most sedimentary rocks form in the ocean or in a shallow sea like this and as uh, mountains erode they wash down rivers, they're carried away, their, their uh, sediments are brought down into the ocean or the sea and they start to pile up and they pile up in layers like this. So we have Weathering happened, breaking the rocks up, erosion happening, carrying it away, and eventually it, it, it gets deposited in the sea. So this is what we call deposition, and it deposits in these, in these layers and layers and layers of rocks. Sea level may go down 
or maybe this uh, piece of land is actually uplifted above sea level by tectonic forces, and um, various other things might then happen. You've got compaction and uh, cementation. In other words, it's cementing itself together. And what you end up with here then is sedimentary rocks. So basically layers of sediments that uh, are deposited somewhere, get compacted, and then cement themselves together. And you end up with sedimentary rock layers. Um, so by looking at this, can you figure out where the oldest layer is and the youngest layer is? Well, the oldest layer, of course, is down here on the bottom, because that was laid down first. And in fact, this would be like a basalt layer, perhaps. This might be basalt on the bottom of the ocean floor. And then as uh, those layers get laid down, they get younger and younger and younger. And the youngest layer, of course, is on top. It's a bit like uh, if you were to uh, have a recycling bin of newspapers, and every day you, um, you toss the re your, your newspaper out in the recycling bin, the, um, the oldest newspaper would be the one on the bottom, and the youngest newspaper would be the one on the top of the stack. Of course, rocks don't have dates on them like newspapers do, so all we can really tell is which one's oldest and which one's youngest by looking at them. It's also a little bit like the, um, the little sand uh, things you can do at the fair. And the oldest layer, of course, that you put in is the one that you put in first, and it's at the bottom, and they just stack themselves up. What we call this uh, idea that the youngest layers are on top is the law of superposition. And the law of superposition, super, uh, is the root word for above. So like Superman is above the average man, or a supervisor is above you uh, in, in the company that you work for. And so the law of super, superposition basically says that the youngest layer uh, is above the oldest layer. There it is. It's a pretty simple one, really. And as we look at these various strata, and that's what these layers are called in geology, we call them strata, um, the law of superposition just tells you that oldest layers are on the bottom, youngest layers are on the top in an undisturbed um, sedimentary uh, rock sequence like this. So this rock sequence we call the geologic column. So if you take a little chunk of a cliff, for instance, or um, a sedimentary layers like this, we call the geologic column. And you can go through there and label kind of what each of those things are, whether they're um, siltstone or limestone or shale or various uh, uh, various grittiness of sandstone and so forth. And uh, that's the geologic column. And in that geologic column, you might find fossils. And what we find is that fossils from the older layers toward the bottom tend to be very, very primitive fossils. They're old and uh, very simple organisms. And then as we move our way up toward the younger and younger layers, we get a much more diverse a set of fossils, and also much more complicated, more complex fossils as uh, life forms changed over uh, hundreds of millions of years. Pretty interesting, and we can uh, start to use those fossils also to, to figure out the dates of these rocks. So let's take a look at, uh, at how this works. You may have a bunch of sediments that have been laid down, uh, deposited in a shallow sea or an ocean, and sometimes what happens is uh, is uplift or tilting so, for instance, this might be on the edge of a, uh, an area that was getting shoved around by tectonic plates, and, and here's an area that got pushed um, like this. It, it's maybe the edge of a large fold, or it could be, um, could be down here in the lower left that somewhere down here there was a, a big intrusion of igneous rock that bulged the, the land up, and we're just looking at the edge of, uh, of what became a large uh, hill or even a small mountain. So uh, tilting might occur like this, and, and once you tilt something up like this, of course, when something's sticking up in the air, erosion is going to happen. So weathering breaks down the rocks here, and erosion will then carry those rocks away, whether that's by wind or water or glacier, and it tends to want to flatten out surfaces. And erosion will do that. And so here we have erosion that's created uh, a nice flat surface. Of course, it's not going to be perfectly flat. The uh, erosive surface here may be, this layer here may be a little bit more resistant to erosion, so it might be sticking up a little bit more, more of a bump. And maybe the sandstone here is a little bit softer, and so it might erode more and be more of a little valley or a trough there. And um, so it's not going to be perfectly flat like this, but we're going to go with a simple erosive surface like this. And something like sea level 
which changes all the time, might rise. And of course, when you have seas, you often then have deposition occurring again. Sediments wash down a river into the sea and then are deposited in nice um, uh, flat layers like that. And you end up with a, another sequence of sedimentary rocks like so. So what you can um, see here is that there's definitely a break here in the geologic column. We've got a definite something different happened. And what we call that is an unconformity. An unconformity is simply a break in the geologic column. In other words, it doesn't conform to the usual stack the layers, stack the layers, stack the layers. It's unconformity. So it's uh, it's it's a it's an unconformist in the sense that it was going along just fine and then something different happened like it tilted it got eroded away and then it continued after that so here we have an unconformity um, what can happen whoops what can happen then uh, let's imagine that you get some uh, erosion happening say a river starts to cut down through these layers it starts to expose uh, expose areas that are wide open like this now like a cliff band on each side of a river, like a canyon, a river canyon. And so you can have these cliffs with these layers of rocks and, um, and start to see what's happening. And as that river cuts down farther and farther and farther, you see farther and farther back into the past. So here's sort of a three-dimensional look at unconformity. This is what we call an angular unconformity. There was some tilting of those layers, then it eroded away, and then more layers were laid down on top of it, just like the one we looked at. And here's a, a picture of what that might look like. This is a very small scale version. You can see the unconformity. You've got tilted layers down here, and then in the erosive surface here, and then you've got new layers being laid down flat on top of it. Here's a large version of an unconformity. This one here obviously had some tilted layers down below. Uh, started off flat, tilted, then eroded away. Somewhere right about here is the unconformity. And above that, then, you've got these nice flat layers again that were laid down in a, uh, in a marine or ocean environment. The Grand Canyon is a great place, of course, to go look for um, layers and layers of sedimentary rock. And what we have in the Grand Canyon is down at the very bottom of the Grand Canyon, the inner gorge uh, of the Grand Canyon. You've got uh, a, a metamorphic rock here and some granite, in fact, some igneous rocks and that were eroded away. And then these, uh, this Uncar group here, this is a bunch of sedimentary rocks that were laid down, and they used to be flat. But this whole area was tilted up, and then was raised above sea level, or sea level dropped. It eroded away to this surface here. You can see the unconformity there, the angular unconformity. And then it was below sea level again. Sandstone piled up, shale piled up and became shale, limestone, uh, piled up here and before this limestone kept going it looks like we have another unconformity and it must have been above sea level and eroded away and then a new limestone started being laid down once it was below sea level again so we can kind of we can find these unconformities all throughout the um, these geologic layers in places like the Grand Canyon and so uh, and unconformity comes in many varieties. We're going to call them all unconformities for now, but this is a disconformity. There's no tilting really involved. Uh, this is a nonconformity. Essentially, don't worry too much about the details of whether it's disconformity or nonconformity or unconformity. We're just going to call them all unconformity for now. We'll keep it simple. So here's a picture of, of another uh, type of unconformity. Basically, you've got underlying metamorphic rock down here. You can see it's all morphed up and, and kind of crazy. And then a nice uh, clean line here of erosion and after that very, very horizontal layers of, of sedimentary rock. And now, of course, this is back above sea level after the rock formed and you can see that it's eroding away and uh, leaving piles and piles of, uh, of sediment and these alluvial fans as they erode and pile up at the base of these cliffs. Pretty interesting. So how can that happen? Well, here's, here's an example of how uh, an unconformity can happen without any tilting going on. Let's imagine that you have two different locations. These could be miles apart. And uh, one of those locations, let's say, gets uplifted. So it could be 
tectonic forces or plates coming together or um, or uh, uh, crust that's being bent by um, convergence. Anyway, one location is uplifted above sea level and one is still below sea level. So the one that's uh, above sea level, there's not going to be a whole lot of deposition happening up here. In fact, if anything, it's going to be eroding away a little bit. But back here in location one, it's still under a shallow sea. And so what's going to happen there? Well, probably some deposition of new sediment layers that will eventually form into rocks. Now, sea level may rise again and put both of them underwater. And as they're both underwater, of course, you're going to end up with deposition of new layers. So there's a sandstone, maybe a shale layer on top of it. And when you then look at these two locations, do they have the same sequence of sedimentary layers? Well, let's take a look. We're going to grab a couple of columns here so we can compare them side by side. So we're going to imagine you cut those two out and bring them side by side. Do they have the same layers? Well, it doesn't look like it, but if you shift one of them up a little bit, you can see that, ah, indeed, they do actually share the same bottom layer and the next layer. These all match, this matches, this matches, this matches, this matches, and that doesn't. So uh, location two seems to be missing a couple of layers in here. And then they match again after that. So the spot where that's missing a couple layers, geologists will put a wavy line on there to show that it's an unconformity. It's a break in the geologic column. This one should have a couple of layers. You can see them, these two here. Should have them there, but they're not there. So what can we do? We can actually sort of break that at the unconformity, shift it up, and it starts to match again. Okay, so that works pretty well. Um, the, the, uh, the break, the unconformity, is where there maybe used to be layers and they were eroded away, or in this case, they were simply never even uh, deposited there in the first place at all. So there's an unconformity, and there's a way you can sort of match up two different locations. Even though this one's missing some layers, um, you can match up the ones that do match, and um, then it's a matter of trying to figure out what happened to those two layers. Did they get eroded away, or were they just never deposited there in the first place? So what that might look like in terms of uh, a river canyon, location one might be located uh, in one place where you have uh, layers and layers and layers of rock, and location two might be in another place. Um, so as you uh, look at the cliffs along these rivers here, you might see completely different layers of rock based on where you are. The youngest layers, of course, are way up at the top, and then they get older and older and older as you go down toward the bottom. And so by comparing, um, by comparing the the, the rock outcroppings, the cliffs, at different locations, you can start to build a complete geologic column. The oldest layers way down here, you're not going to see if you're farther up uh, in this canyon because they're, they're still way underground. They're still buried pretty deep. On the other hand, if you're way down here at the uh, bottom area of this river and look up at these cliffs, the highest rock layers you're going to see here may be the rock layers that are just right at river level farther up the river. So um, what uh, we did in class, we took uh, uh, an example of four different cliff outcrops. And uh, we imagined that we were floating down a river in eastern Oregon and, and uh, somewhere. And we, uh, we basically looked at these four outcroppings and tried to arrange them into a complete geologic column. And then answered some questions on that. So you can find. Uh, find that assignment and those things to print out online, and I encourage you to pause here and, uh, and give that your best shot. Um, let's take a look then at, at what that comes up with. Essentially, what we had uh, when we looked at those four different cliffs were four incomplete uh, geologic columns. They had unconformities in them, or this one here that looks complete really only has seven different layers, seven strata, but there are several more strata down below that. So by putting all of these together, we can actually construct a complete geologic column for this whole area. And it has, uh, it has 12 different layers. And here's the river level across, right at the bottom of all these cliffs. Whee! And as you go past these cliffs, you can look up and see uh, what's there. Now, some of these, of course, have 
unconformities that never were laid down, never deposited there, or maybe they were eroded away. And uh, speaking of erosion, as the river flows, it will continue to cut down through these rocks. And so the river itself will do this. It will start to cut down and erode deeper into the, um, into the rocks below it. In this case, at outcrop 4, um, you'll see that there's going to be another rock layer down here. But what is it going to be? Well, it will probably be this dark shale. That dark shale will be the next layer down below the light shale. And so as the river erodes down at outcrop 3, it erodes through the siltstone, and right below the siltstone will most likely be the coarse sandstone, assuming there's no, um, assuming there's no unconformities. And then at outcrop 2, uh, it's eroding down through the fine, sand, fine sandstone right now, and it will erode into the conglomerate below that. What about at outcrop 1? Is there going to be something else below this? We don't know, and we can't know until it actually erodes down through, or if we look maybe perhaps farther down the river, we might know what the next layer down would be. Um, so the youngest layer is on top, the oldest layer is on the bottom, and you can think to yourself, ah, as you're heading down a river like this, essentially you're heading back in time. You're passing older and older and older rock layers the farther down the river you go. Because the farther down the geologic column you go, they're older and older rocks. Kind of cool. So one way that, that um, geologists try and sort of go back in time is by reconstructing the events that happened. And it takes a little bit of uh, sleuth work in a sense, or uh, really just some critical thinking, trying to figure out what happened first, what happened second, what happened next. So if we look at this, um, at these, these various strata that we had before, we can see that down here we had some basalt and then some layers of sedimentary rock, some strata were laid on top of that. It was tilted, some erosion happened, we had some new rock layers going on, and uh, sometimes what happens is what's called an intrusion. So this is where magma intrudes up into the layers of rock above it, and um, eventually will cool into rock. But you can see that right around the intrusion, there's this sort of faint purple color here. What that represents is what happens to the sedimentary rocks or the other rocks that it's intruding into. Well, there's a lot of heat here, and as it pushes up through these rocks, it also has a lot, there's a lot of pressure. And so heat and pressure would lead to metamorphic rocks. So right in that zone there, right where the intrusion comes in, oftentimes there is what's called contact metamorphism. In other words, it morphs up the rocks that it intrudes into. So there might be uh, uh, a bit of sort of a zone here where you'll find a lot of metamorphic rocks right around the outside of this intrusion. And as an intrusion cools, it cools and forms granite usually because uh, granite is uh, formed intrusively underground and has larger crystals because it has more time to cool and grow those crystals. It takes a while for it to cool. To cool. And um, what we can try and do then is, is look at this, this cliff. Well, imagine we're looking at the side of a, a large cliff here. Um, we can try and put all these things in order. What happened first? What happened second? What happened third? So I, uh, I would challenge you to pause the video right now and try and list these things, these seven uh, events in order, and then we'll go over them. Okay, so here we go. What happened first? Well, the first thing that happened had to have been the basalt at the very bottom here was laid down. Uh, lava flowed out and, uh, and made some oceanic plate. And the basalt was definitely the first layer because it's on the bottom. Uh, the next thing that happened, of course, was the deposition of these next few layers of uh, sedimentary rocks. Now, we know that had to happen before this intrusion, for instance, because if this intrusion that magma would have come up through the basalt and then that was all there was, the magma then would have uh, flowed as lava on both sides of this intrusion and just kind of spilled all over the place. It wouldn't have made a large uh, mound 
sticking up like this, it would have just flowed off the sides and have cooled very quickly also, which means it probably wouldn't have looked quite so granitic like granite. Okay, after the deposition of the lower ones, we had the tilting occur, so this whole area was tilted. And then erosion caused the unconformity, flattened off that, um, that landscape. And what came next? Could the intrusion have happened then? Well, if we had just a flattened landscape here at the unconformity, the intrusion would have come up and again spilled out over the edges and left a big uh, pool of lava, you could say, or a pool of, uh, of igneous rock. But we don't see that here. It, so the, um, the deposition of these upper layers here must have come next. And then, finally, the intrusion of granite would have intruded into those upper layers and then eventually we get to the present day surface up here, which is the uh, which are the trees. All right, here's another example. Here's a, a very similar rock sequence, a cliff. And go ahead and pause and try and list these things in order from one through seven, the different uh, layers and events that happened. Okay, let's take a look at this one. We're actually going to look at this one backwards. So sometimes an easier way to, uh, to figure this out is to work your way backwards from what happened most recently. Well, we know the trees are the most recent thing, so we're going to kind of put this in reverse mode. The trees, and then obviously right before the trees, must have been this uh, deposition of the upper layers, which would have less, left us with a landscape like this. So what happened next? How did we get to this landscape? Well, it had to be erosion of that unconformity, right? Erosion happened there. And then um, next up we see that, well, the intrusion is definitely going through the all these layers here. So the intrusion was probably number four, although we're not quite sure if it happened before the tilt or after the tilt. So we're going to just assume that it happened um, after the tilt, but uh, the, uh, the tilting and the intrusion probably could be switched around and, and we're not sure which one would be which. After the tilting, uh, or sorry, before the tilting, number two would have been the, the deposition of those lower layers, and the basalt, of course, would have been the the, um, the first thing to occur. So sometimes working backwards is an easy way to, to figure those out. Now, um, what that does is this uh, technique allows us to look at more complicated landscapes and figure out what, uh, what happened, what's going on here. So in this case, you look and go, oh, what happened first? Well, obviously, it had to be something down low. So where was the lowest? Well, this is all tilted around. So before it tilted, the lowest layer was A here. And K looks like it's even lower, but K isn't really a layer. K is an intrusion. It actually even picked up some of the rocks from A and B above it. So A happened first, B must have happened next, and then K would have happened third, intruded into those, and then there must have been, um, again, this was all flat at the time. So you may need to tilt your head and imagine this was all flat. And then there was uh, some erosion that happened and made an unconformity right here between B and C. And then C happened. D, E, what on earth is this thing? This looks like some sort of a shifting of weird. Okay, we'll come back to this in just a minute. And as those layers kept going and kept going and kept going, eventually the whole area got tilted and um, eroded away. A surface, and then we've got these these two layers up here, I and J, that were uh, deposited on top of that. What is L? This is a weird looking thing. L is actually representing uh, another type of intrusion, and again, this is um, igneous rock, so it's magma that came up through a crack or a, um, some sort of a weak area. It came up through and intruded. You can see that it's a little bit more resistant to erosion, form these little hills over here, and also must have um, found a, a weak area between these two layers where it seeped in and then cooled into rock as well. What we call a, a real thin intrusion like this, we call it a dike if it's somewhat vertical, and if it's more horizontal, we call it a sill, kind of like a window sill. And uh, here's kind of an example of what one of those might look like. This is a, a dike, or kind of in between a dike and a sill. You might call it a dill, a psych, maybe. Um, my daughter actually saw um, one of these intrusions that went back and forth kind of uh, diagonally like, a, like a, a lightning bolt. And she said, oh, it's like a psych and a dill. It's, it's psychedelic. Pretty good, pretty good. Um, 
So uh, dike and Acilda's are essentially just igneous intrusions that happen. So what's the deal with that, that fault, that weird arrow-looking thing that, that we saw? Here's how a fault works. Basically, a fault is uh, blocks of rock sliding past each other. And you can see, in this case here, this diagonal line is the fault. And this reddish band used to line up together. And so this thing moved, what is that, probably 30 feet or so, as these two blocks slid past each other. And this one got shoved up above it. Obviously, this happened long before the road was built, because that would have really messed up the road. Um, and so there's the direction of those two blocks. It's, it's rocks sliding past each other. This lower example, again, the same kind of a thing. You can see where these, um, these layers used to line up. They don't line up anymore. And so what's happening here? We've got a fault where rocks are sliding past each other. What would have pushed this large block up the hill? Well, nothing really could just push on this thing unless it's, oh, I don't know, a Yeti or Chuck Norris or something. Um, the problem is, is that there's nothing really that pushes rock uphill like this. Unless it all happened before erosion eroded away and formed this cliff. So this probably used to be a rock band, much more like the one in the upper picture, and then erosion would have chopped off the edge of this thing and um, eroded away and made this cliff form after the fact. So how does a fault work? Well, here's uh, here's an animation of a fault, essentially. So you've got all these sedimentary layers, and as that um, block is shoved against the other block, it uh, slides along that crack called a fault, like so. And you end up with those layers then offset. Now, other things can uh, can happen, like an igneous intrusion, for instance, might then cross right over that fault and cool into uh, to granite. Now, how do you know that that intrusion happened after the fault, other than you just saw it on the animation? Um, if this intrusion would have occurred before the fault, this igneous intrusion would have been broken right about there, and this upper section would have shifted up to the left and it would have been separated and shifted and so the intrusion would have been broken and shifted with the fault but in this case you can see that it's not and so therefore it must have come after the fault so other things then can occur let's uh, let's see if you got stuff sticking up in the air like that eventually erosion is going to come and level that out and carry away some of that sediment um, perhaps sea level rises and you get some deposition maybe occurring so then you get all this stuff buried underneath some more layers of sediment, so maybe some sandstone and so forth, and uh, uh, siltstone or shale or whatever. And so you end up with all these layers of sediment over the top of that. And uh, what else can occur? Well, so there's, that's what we call an unconformity, right? There's a break in the rock layer there. Uh, maybe another intrusion comes in. There's a dike there sticking up, and uh, that will eventually cool into magma. And now you have something kind of interesting because not only do you have a bunch of sedimentary layers that you can figure out which came first and second and third and fourth, but you also have some igneous rocks. And igneous rocks have a birth date, which allows us to do some absolute dating. So if you look at the radioactive um, isotopes in these intrusions, you can actually figure out how old they are within you know, a pretty short amount of time. Uh, like within a million years or so, you can figure out their age pretty accurately. So let's imagine that you uh, absolute date these intrusions, and you find that the one on the left is about 270 million years old. The, uh, the lower intrusion is 280 million years old. And you even uh, can maybe find that the basalt down below all this is 300 million years old. So as you're looking at this cliff, you go, okay, this is great. This gives me some ideas maybe on how old the sedimentary layers are in between, which is pretty helpful, especially if you find some fossils. So if you find some fossils uh, in this layer of, let's say it's sandstone, those fossils must have lived and then died while that sandstone was being um, deposited and compacted right there. So during the time of the sandstone being deposited, that's when these fossils were alive and then died. So when was that? 
Well, we just got to look at our um, our geologic column and figure that out. Here's some choices. Let's see if you can figure this out. Would it be a thousand years old? 250 million years old? 275 million years old? 290 million years? Or 320 million years? Go ahead and pause and see if you can figure out. You may need to list out what happened first. So maybe list out, okay, number one, basalt was laid down. Number two, three, this happened. Four, this happened. And see if you can figure out um, how old those fossils must be. Go ahead and pause it and I'll come back with an answer. All right, so here we go. The uh, correct answer is somewhere in the range of 290 million years old. Here's why. Um, obviously, um, obviously the fossils must have come um, after the basalt was laid down because the basalt had to be there before you got these other layers. So if it's after the basalt, it must be just a little bit younger than 300 million years old. However, the sandstone here must have been there when this intrusion intruded into it. If the sandstone wasn't there, this magma would have spilled all over the place and hardened into a, um, uh, a layer of igneous rock way down here somewhere. But the sandstone was there 280 million years ago. Therefore, these fossils must have been around somewhere between 280 and 300 million years ago. This is the only option then that it could be 290. Now, they, of course, they could be 281 million years. They could be 299 million years, somewhere in the range between 280 and 300 million years ago. All right, let's try another one. Let's imagine you find some fossil, fossils of, uh, these are ginkgo leaves. You find some fossils of these leaves in, uh, in these layers up here. So what does that tell you about how old those layers and those fossils are? I'll give you the same choices. Go ahead and pause. Uh, again, you may need to write down the order of events here and see if you can figure out what happened and when. Okay, so these ginkgo leaves um, are in these two layers. These layers, were they here? Were these layers here when this um, when this intrusion happened? Well, they had to be because this intrusion intruded into these layers. So these layers must be at least 270 million years old. However, can they be older than 280 million years? Well, no, because 280 million years ago was this intrusion, and obviously this intrusion happened well before these layer, these sedimentary layers were laid down, were deposited. Therefore, the uh, those layers and those fossils must be somewhere between 270 and 280 million years old. Again, it could be 272, it could be 279, or 276.3, whatever, but somewhere between 270 and 280 million years old. So by using um, a combination of relative dating and absolute dating, you're able to find the uh, a fairly precise age of various fossils and various sedimentary layers. And um, what that allows us to do as geologists, and this uh, has taken literally thousands upon thousands of geologists using thousands upon thousands of different locations around the world to create what's called a chronostratigraphic chart, which means, chrono means time, strata means layers, and graphic means a graph or a picture. And so what we've got here is a, uh, a graph of the time that various strata were laid down. And this goes all the way from today, which is this date here, all the way back millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago, all the way back to the start of the Earth about 4.6 billion years ago. So let's zoom in on this uh, section here, and maybe you'll recognize uh, some of these names here, like the, this is the Jurassic period. Oh, like Jurassic Park, the movie. And the Jurassic Park, of course, is named after the Jurassic period of time, and this is a time when the um, 
when the dinosaurs were very very dominant on Earth. And so each of these uh, each of these different time periods lasts for a few million years, and we know the very fairly precise dates of these of these years. So like here, 1.5 or uh, sorry. 157.3 million years ago, plus or minus 1 million years. That's about the accuracy of the um, of the absolute dating that we we're able to to nail down at. So we know that, for instance, if um, if something lived during the Oxfordian period, a fossil say that lived during this period, it must be between 157 and 163 years old, 100 million years old, I should say. And it's allowed uh, scientists to essentially construct a um, a complete geologic column for the entire Earth, and allows us then to, uh, by comparing all these different sites, we can then figure out what lived when, uh, during what years, which uh, species went extinct when, which species um, adapted and survived or adapted and changed into uh, various other species at various times. It's given us really a rich history of the Earth as we know it. Thanks for watching.